Uh, good morning. In this session, we shall be talking about practical criticism. Practical criticism is also known by a number of uh, other labels and names, such as analysis, verbal analysis, close reading, textual analysis, etc. Um, it refers basically to the procedure adopted when we want to understand and respond to a poem in order to understand its meaning and the experience that it is trying to communicate to us. Uh, it's not as though uh, this is a procedure or a method that evolved only in the 20th century with the advent of the new criticism. If you go back into the past, uh, you do come across a um, large number of examples of uh, very sensitive and intelligent uh, readers of uh, literature who have commented on the uh, subtleties, on uh, all those um, complexities which are there in the texture, in the language, in the structure of uh, work of uh, literature. But uh, as uh, an uh, acknowledged uh, procedure of uh, reading and as a method supported by theoretical approaches, practical criticism came to be known as the method advocated by the new critics. I'm not going into the relationship between the method known as uh, practical criticism or close reading and the theoretical approaches of the new criticism. But we need to remember that the new critics uh, argued that uh, a work of uh, literature, let's say a poem, possesses a distinctive structure of its own. It has a unity which binds together the various elements which go into the making of a poem. And the new critics also argued that there's only one way you can arrive at the so-called meaning of the poem or the experience that the poem is trying to objectify. Uh, the one and the only means is to go through the poem, to respond to the words on the page uh, as closely as possible, as intelligently as possible and as sensitively as possible. This was also demonstrated in the practice of the new critics themselves from the tall figure of uh, T.S. Eliot uh, whose critical essays are interspersed with uh, very insightful readings of certain lines and passages for example from the metaphysical poet John Donne or passages from John Milton, etc. So, uh, on the whole, uh, we could remember that uh, with the advent of the new criticism uh, as a matter of pedagogy, teaching and uh, learning, that is, uh, practical criticism became a very efficient uh, tool of uh, taking literary texts to the students. Um, this, of course, was very successful especially with the availability of uh, very sophisticated uh, textbooks like uh, Understanding Poetry, edited by Cleant Brooks and uh, R.P. Warren, and a number of uh, similar uh, anthologies, which also contained close and critical readings. Uh, what I'm going to do in this session is to first draw your attention to uh, what we mean by close reading and what are the do's and the don'ts in the new, in um, uh, practical criticism or in close reading. Um, the normal procedure is to first tell you what you should do and then go on to tell you what you should not do. But I think I reverse the order and begin by telling you what you should not do if you are doing practical criticism or trying to uh, 
read a poem closely uh, for the following are the things you should not do first of all do not attempt a paraphrase of the poem you are reading you know a paraphrase is um uh, summarizing let us say a poem uh, in prose and um, the summary uh, is expected to uh, bring in whatever is there in the poem it's almost like transferring what was contained in uh, verse form or poetic form into prose form this is known as paraphrase the new critics uh, very strongly opposed to this uh, procedure uh, if you remember cleanth brooks in his famous book um, the well wrought urn has a chapter which is titled the heresy of paraphrase heresy is uh, an unorthodox uh, practice especially in the domain of uh, religion and worship and belief so by extension it means a wrong practice therefore uh, clear brooks was arguing that uh, um, reading uh, poetry should not lead to a paraphrase of the poem or a summary of the poem what are the reasons why one should avoid paraphrasing the poem and the reasons given by the new critics are as follows number 1 the paraphrase cannot be a substitute for the poem itself the poem itself and its paraphrase are two separate things um, they are not one and the same and there is always the temptation for the student uh, not to struggle with the poem not to put in uh, his energy in trying to read closely and become aware of uh, the subtleties and the structuring of various elements um, it would be very easy for him to go in for a paraphrase and then convince himself that i know what the poem is about and uh, in writing a paraphrase i have written very honestly what is contained in the poem uh, this is uh, one reason the paraphrase uh, cannot be the poem itself it cannot be a substitute for the poem let's ask one more question uh, all right let's say it's a wrong procedure but what is lost when you make a paraphrase let us say of a stanza of a well known uh, poem now if you think of uh, the best remembered lines from uh, english poetry and uh, try to write a paraphrase of that uh, line for example uh, take the line from keats a thing of a beauty is a joy forever a thing of beauty is a joy forever now however good you are in paraphrasing the line the experience that you get in uh, reading the original line in keats's poem um cannot be matched by the best paraphrase that you make for the simple reason that the line uh, in the original poem by keats works at the same time at many levels for example um at one level you have the arrangement of the sounds there is a rhythmic pattern and um, in this line there is a cesura or a pause um, and therefore the experience of uh, listening to the line sensitively is a complex experience you know you are uh, responding to the meaning 
you are responding to the sound pattern you are responding to the uh, rhythm and you are also uh, very keenly aware of the ups and downs and the pattern in which the sound moves and if you are um, an experienced reader even while reading it aloud uh, you may be responding to the images uh, which may be there in that line of a particular poem and that's the reason why the paraphrase can never match the original line or the stanza. Um, the same can be said about uh, translating. Generally we mean by translation, uh, translating from the original language into another language. But sometimes in practical criticism, the interpretation that we write uh, is not really a critical interpretation. It's almost like translating very close to the paraphrase that I was talking about. This also is not the purpose of close reading. These are two things which we need to avoid. The third is uh, uh, there is a very strong feeling among students that uh, close reading should arrive at an evaluation of the poem. And, uh, you are required to make uh, comments summarizing your judgment or evaluation by saying it's a great poem, it's a very good poem. Uh, these should be avoided. It's not that uh, as a reader, uh, you are not making an evaluation of the poem. Ultimately, after reading it intelligently, you would certainly uh, have something like a judgment in your mind uh, and you may be uh, comparing the poem with the other poems that you have read but this should not be part of the practical criticism uh, we are not there uh, to adopt a very juridical position and judge the poem and make uh, uh, such judgments evaluating and placing the poem. The best we could say is that if you feel that um, there is a looseness of the structure or that a particular metaphor is confused, you can draw attention in your essay that you write to the weaknesses that you come across in the poem uh, without resorting to statements like this is a failure, etc. You can certainly point out um, the weaknesses um, in the poem or the text you are reading, but to the extent possible, uh, juridical statements should be avoided. Uh, another thing that uh, you should not be doing is um, to take up the so-called theme of the poem or the subject matter of the poem and then go on uh, elaborating on it and uh, writing your own uh, comments on that uh, theme or on that subject matter. Uh, for example, if you are uh, reading uh, uh, the poems that John Donne wrote on death and uh, especially the poem which ends with a paradoxical statement, uh, death thou shalt die. Now, Obviously, the entire poem is on the theme of death, but it does not mean that once you understand that the central theme of that uh, poem by Dunn is death, you will go on commenting on what death is and what death means to human beings in a very loose philosophical manner. No, uh, practical criticism has no space for it. What you should be demonstrating in your essay based on practical criticism is what is the distinctive uh, thing that the poet is bringing out with reference to death? Um, does he express uh, a feeling of terror about death or is he asserting 
um, that there is something called immortality promised by religion and therefore one need not be terrorized by it. it it's not even a question of what uh, Dan believed in. We want to know what the poem tells us through its words, through its images and through its symbolism. So if you come across uh, uh, a poem uh, whose theme you are able to understand by a quick reading, uh, you should not resort to writing an essay on the theme. Uh, we do not expect you uh, to take that as the starting point for uh, a long essay on what you think about death or what you think about the central theme and the uh, experience, the central experience of the poem you are reading. What's important is how is a certain perspective, how is a certain viewpoint, how is a certain way of understanding that experience is communicated in the poem. And the uh, emphasis should be on uh, how it is communicated. You know, in um, uh, practical criticism, our attention should be focused on both the themes. Uh, what is being said and how is it being said? But if you want me to um, tell you which of the two should have greater space in your writing, in your essay, based on close reading, I would certainly say uh, the emphasis should be on how it is said. Uh, what, is it, what is said in the poem, the so-called theme of the poem, is certainly useful to you. Uh, I'm going to tell you that um, when you start writing, reading a poem, uh, before writing your essay, uh, it does help you to arrive at um, the theme and the subject matter of the poem because once um, your mind knows um, what this poem is generally about, uh, then uh, it becomes easier for you to pay attention to all other things uh, so that at the center you have the theme and then around it you have all those elements of the poem which contribute to uh, the expression uh, of that particular experience or subject. It's like an organizing principle which helps you to relate the images, etc. Otherwise, there is a possibility that um, you may not be able to uh, bring all those elements together. You may respond to them individually, you may know what this image perhaps indicates or what this symbol uh, stands for. But then the more important thing you need to do is how do all these elements uh, knit themselves together? How do they come together so that uh, very efficiently uh, it is uh, communicated in a poem. So the use of uh, discovering or understanding the theme of a poem is that from that point onwards, your mind can work more methodically and try to relate every single element in the poem directly or indirectly to that particular theme. That element may either support the theme or it may bring in a contradiction, the opposite point of view. All such things can happen in a poem. And that's the reason why uh, we don't advise students to uh, understand the theme and then go on elaborating upon it. Because that also uh, will be like evading the poem and not going honestly into the poem. Uh, these are the things that one should not do uh, when he or she is attempting a close reading. Let me quickly 
remind you of what I have been saying. Uh, do not attempt a paraphrase of the poem and therefore do not attempt to provide a prose summary of the poem. And do not attempt to translate the poem uh, into a very simple language um, by reducing its complexity and its uh, uh, rich meaning. Uh, do not uh, go on uh, expressing your own views on the so-called theme or the subject matter of the poem. And then it's also important that you must arrive at the central theme in the subject matter, but it should be used by you in trying to put together the various elements of the poem. And that should not instead become uh, the theme for uh, your elaboration. Our attempt, as I said, is just to point out what it is about, but more elaborately and more patiently and more intelligently try to show uh, how it is said, uh, rather than focusing only on what is being said. And if you read uh, Brooks's essay on um, formalist criticism and also the introduction to this excellent book, Understanding Poetry, which begins with a letter to the teacher, um, the two editors uh, tell us that um, the teacher uh, should not uh, use the poem for didactic teaching. It's not that you take one single line from the poem and then take it as a moral aphorism or a moral statement and then go on preaching the students. No. What we are expected to do is to give the holistic experience of the whole poem. It is one entity and this is what we need to do. These are uh, some of the tones. Now we shall come to what you should be doing. Um, I'm not uh, going uh, into um, all the subtleties involved here. We are looking more or less at uh, one practical way of uh, how we can develop the skill of uh, close reading. I'll be confining and limiting my comments to that. Uh, one of the uh, inhibitions uh, most students have is the wrong notion that uh, poetry is very difficult. Uh, this is a very wrong notion. Uh, it, this notion comes to us when we are not familiar with uh, poems or that uh, um, we hesitate to read and uh, enjoy poems. So don't take a poem as a mathematical problem or a puzzle which should be solved. As um, the two critics I mentioned say, it's a way of saying you know, a, a human being who also happens to be a poet, he's saying something to you, he's talking to you, he's uh, um, explaining certain things to you and being a poet, he not only wants you to understand ideas, but also to see how it actually happened and how so many things were part of uh, his experience. He wants to give you everything and talk about it and therefore adopt this attitude that a poem is like a conversation or maybe it's a monologue by the poet which you are overhearing. Or maybe a poet is talking to you, addressing you. And that I think will uh, uh, prepare the proper state of mind. Uh, it's not a puzzle. It's not a mathematical problem. It's in a language which we more or less understand. And therefore, the one thing we must do is to read it. Um, I would say 
uh, read the poem twice at least um, because in the first reading as it always happens our mind is looking for certain clues uh, what is this about uh, what is the writer trying to tell me now uh, this is important uh, as the first step um, a quick reading of the poem or maybe if you want the very first reading to be uh, patient and a close reading um, it will give you some clue and the clue will come to you um, by two or three things we generally find in a poem one it may have a statement itself and the rest of the poem could be in support of the statement um, some of the poems even some very good poems for that matter may contain a statement uh, which is directly related to the so-called theme or the experience as i said earlier this is not the end of the reading it is the beginning of the reading now, so now you know uh, all right this is a poem uh, and the poem is about probably this Always keep this in mind. Uh, do not come to a final and a definitive conclusion about what the poem is about. Uh, think that uh, to make a beginning, I, I will think that this is the theme or the subject matter. Broadly speaking, the poem is about this. And that uh, helps you because um, you can clear out certain other things and focus on uh, what the author could be saying about a particular uh, subject or experience. This would be the uh, first reading and I was trying to tell you that sometimes uh, a statement itself in the poem uh, should help you uh, to understand what the central subject is. Later, I'll be dealing with a poem and you'll find that uh, the statement which comes at the very end of the poem tells you what the poem is about. Uh, that's one. Uh, secondly, the uh, images uh, which are the most important aspect of uh, any poem, uh, they are the ones which can indicate the meaning of the poem to you. The images. Images are those things which you can visualize, uh, which you can experience as though you are listening to them. Uh, there may be images which you feel um, they provoke you to get a sensation of touching certain things. So, uh, images are related to our sensations, uh, they are related to our five senses. So uh, the best thing you can do is, uh, when you come across those uh, images in the poem, uh, try to visualize those images, you see. Uh, that again is an indication, uh, repeated images, very strong images, will tell you that the poem is broadly about this experience. That is the second one. Uh, the third is um, even a short poem may contain a symbol. You know, a symbol is any object that stands for another thing. So you, you may uh, come across um, a, a symbol and uh, generally uh, a symbol in a poem, uh, it uh, operates very powerfully and um, it is the one which uh, uh, brings things around the central experience of the poem. Uh, the next thing you should be doing is uh, pay attention to the use of words. Um, the new critics 
always made it a slogan that a poem is nothing but words on the page. Uh, forget all the big comments and uh, uh, high intellectual comments about what literature is. Basically, essentially, its words organized in a particular way, in a particular structure. So the uh, process of close reading is nothing but learning to respond to the words. What do we mean by responding to the words? Um, I will use two terms which will be very useful to us. Uh, the two terms are uh, uh, denotation and connotation. Uh, most of the words that we use have uh, two levels of meaning. Uh, denotation refers to the referential meaning, the direct meaning of a word um, can be described as the denotative, uh, as you can see from uh, the word denotative, uh, it denotes something. It refers to something. For example, uh, a word like uh, black um, basically refers to a color, isn't it? Now that's a denotative meaning, the dictionary meaning and the referential meaning. But in a work of uh, literature, especially in poetry, the words operate at another level also. And this is known as the connotative level. And the connotative level is the suggested meanings of the word, not just the one-to-one -one meaning uh, of a word, but uh, beyond that referential meaning, the word may bring in certain suggestions. We also use another important word here, associations. See, um, a word uh, sometimes even uh, a plain word may create certain associations, provoke certain uh, feelings in you because words are uh, bound by or they have around them a network of these associations. I used the word black, but if I use the word dark, uh, you know, uh, dark could refer to a certain kind of complexion. It could uh, refer to the atmosphere late in the evening after sunset. Uh, it could uh, refer to uh, what you could find, you know, in the form of a deep shadow, etc. But is the meaning of the word limited only to this. These are more or less referential meanings, the direct meanings of the word dark. But we also use the same word uh, with other meanings also, isn't it? When I say, oh, he has a dark design in the sense, he has a plan or a purpose in his mind, which is not good, which could be evil. And that's why I use the word dark design. Um, I can also say, for example, oh, it was a dark day in my life, uh, where perhaps I'm talking about something that unfortunate that happened uh, on that particular day, isn't it? Uh, so you, as a sensitive reader of poetry, uh, you have to develop this uh, skill of uh, understanding the associations of the word and the connotative meanings of the word. Uh, later on, when uh, I look at some poems, I'll be able to elaborate on what we mean by uh, responding to the various levels of the word. Why is this important to us? It's important because uh, the so-called meanings of the poem uh, can be gathered only through the words used and especially through the connotations and the associations of the uh, word used. You know, 
if you have read uh, uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T. S. Eliot, the poem begins with these lines: "Let's go then, you and I, when the evening is laid out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon the table." A student who wants to understand the opening lines of this poem, the lines I read out to you, has to first of all try to understand what the word table uh, refers to here. We're still talking only about a referential meaning. What does the word table refer to? The table that um, I use in order to write or do my work on or is it some other kind of table and now uh, because it is preceded by the word uh, patient uh, it should bring to your mind that this is uh, probably the operation table because the poet is talking about a patient uh, and etherized uh, made unconscious and then, of course, you know why this um, image is used and why this comparison is used. I am uh, trying to draw your attention to how we look at uh, a very plain, simple word like table. Uh, and even the referential meaning can help us in trying to go deeper into the poem. Uh, that's how uh, you need in... Uh, uh, doing your close reading, sensitivity to the levels at which the words uh, operate. Therefore, as you go on uh, reading with some more or less broad, vague idea of what the poem is about, I would advise you to look closely uh, at images, at uh, symbols, and then the meanings of the uh, words uh, themselves and they would help you uh, a great deal um, in, in, in trying to arrive at the meaning of the poem. I would also like to bring in another thing here. Um, a poem gives us a complex experience because it makes us look at uh, various uh, perspectives and various aspects of that particular feeling or experience. And many times uh, uh, there may be these perspectives which contradict one another. I mean, in, in real life, uh, we would say, oh, this is illogical because you say something and you're contradicting it. But in a poem, uh, many times there is very deliberately this ambiguity. Uh, there is this ambivalence also that um, uh, what the poet is trying to say to you um, comes to you through images which may suggest opposites see? which may suggest things which may not uh, blend with uh, one another this is not a defect in a poem uh, this in fact is the strength of a poem that it might give you um, many perspectives many perspectives and therefore you need to do this uh, to understand how words operate, how images operate, and what kind of associations they create in us. And then, um, what should we do about the speaking voice in a poem? Now, many poems use the first person singular, I, especially in the poems of Wordsworth. You repeatedly come across the word I, uh, and it happens in the poems of John Donne also. Um, should we, in our essay, based on uh, our practical criticism or close reading, uh, go on saying that this is the poet who is saying this and the poet feels, um, the new critics would argue that uh, this is not correct because you are know, once again uh, assuming that it is the poet himself uh, speaking and expressing his so-called personality. 
let's not go into the discussion of that issue. Uh, we'll just tell ourselves that uh, to the extent possible, we will use the word the speaker. Uh, the, there are three things that we should identify in um, making uh, an intelligent close reading of a poem. Number one, the speaker of the poem. From the poem itself, what do we know about the speaking voice or the speaker of the poem? We have already taken it for granted that it is uh, not Wordsworth or John Lamb. Uh, who is the speaker? Can we can we uh, identify him? Is there any clue given in the poem about um, the speaker? Uh, we need to do this. This is a very important clue that leads us to the understanding of the poem. Um, for example, in uh, most of the poems of John Donne, the poet speaks like a character in a play. You know? um, sometimes, for example, in the line, for God's sake, hold your tongue and let me laugh. It's as though uh, a person is speaking to a friend or another person very vehemently and uh, um, very argumentatively and a little aggressively also. Hold your tongue, shut up and then let me speak. Now, uh, this helps you a great deal to identify the speaker uh, as a lover who is trying to argue with somebody who has a different idea of love or uh, a different perspective on love. Do you understand this? This, this helps you uh, because ultimately the poem is about uh, one perspective on love which may run contrary to the usual traditional understanding of what love should be and uh, that we understand by identifying the nature of the speaker. Secondly, we should try to understand the context again from the poem. Uh, nobody is going to explain the context to you. From the clues given in the poem, you should understand uh, the context of the poem. Uh, for example, uh, in a very lovely poem by Wordsworth, um, surprised by joy. Um, and it continues and the speaker says, uh, I was so surprised by joy, I wanted to share with whom but you. And then I realized that you are dead. So you know the speaker is someone who has lost his wife. And now he has an experience of happiness and spontaneously he goes on to share with, share it with her. Then realizes that, oh my God, she is not any longer there. She is dead. And how could I forget it? So the context is this. The context does not mean the social context or um, the background. No, no, we are not talking about that. We are talking about what emerges from the reading of the poem. What's the emotional context of the speaker? The third important aspect is identifying the tone. You know? We use the word tone to refer to the tone of the voice or the speaking voice. Just as we speak about the pitch of our voice, we also speak about the tone of the voice. In practical criticism, the tone is the expression of the attitude of the speaker. The tone is the expression of the attitude of the speaker. For example, is he making a plain statement? Is he asking us to take that statement at the face value as it is or is he being ironical is he saying something and meaning another thing that's the meaning of irony 
uh, irony is when there are two possible interpretations and meanings of uh, something said in a literary text. Um, we also use a very colloquial way of explaining it and saying it's nothing but saying something but meaning another thing. So this can, can be understood by locating the tone of the is it an argumentative tone? Is it the tone of uh, an honest person who is only making a simple bland statement? Or is it the tone of the of a person uh, who is being ironical about what he is saying and wants us to be alert to it? Therefore, we need to understand the tone. Sometimes it may be a very mischievous tone. Sometimes it may be a very somber and a serious tone. Sometimes it may be a tone which plays with uh, paradoxes. So that, that's very important. Otherwise, um, you may fail to understand the meaning of the poem. You know, many um, inexperienced readers would miss this. Uh, it's important that you should identify the tone of the play. So let me put together the do's when you are doing uh, practical criticism or a prose reading. First of all, um, give the poem at least two readings. And these two readings in the first stage should help you to understand the central theme or the subject and um, this sometimes comes through to us um, through the statements which may be there in the poem itself or more generally uh, they can this central subject can be understood through the important images that we find in the poem or we may come across a central metaphor a hidden comparison or a symbol in a poem uh, which may take you to the central experience of the poem and that's the first stage when uh, you have a broad understanding of what the poem could be about and then begins the process of uh, reading uh, uh, slowly uh, closely and patiently by giving attention, equal attention to all that you find in the poem. Uh, keep this rule of the thumb in your mind. Whatever is there in the poem is there for a purpose. I hope you have understood the statement. It's a simple rule of the thumb. Whatever is there in the poem is there for a particular purpose purpose. In a good poem, there is nothing which is superfluous, uh, extra or irrelevant. It's always there. The second rule of the thumb is when a poet uses images and symbols, it's not by way of bringing in ornamentation or the so-called aesthetic appeal. Uh, a good poet uses images to say something, to communicate something. It's very necessary for young readers of poetry to come out of that wrong notion that uh, in a poem uh, there is, uh, you know, something like uh, the icing on the cake. Was as though you write something and then you try to beautify it and make it more aesthetically attractive by adding images. No, no. Images are part of the meaning. And lastly, uh, if you learn to uh, read by responding to the sound pattern, many times the sounds themselves and the pattern should take you to the meaning of the poem or the meaning of a passage. Um, look at the great lines in a 
poet like Shakespeare. Nothing, 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 nothing. The very way the sound pattern works because of the repetition um, I helps you to identify the feeling and the tone with which King Lear is expressing himself, his sense of the meaninglessness and the absurdity of uh, life, uh, isn't it? So, uh, sounds are also part of the meaning of the poem. Don't talk about the music of poetry, the loveliness of the sounds of a poem, the sounds and how they are arranged in a poem are all part of the meaning of the poem. So this is how you would be uh, reading. And my practical advice to young readers is uh, read as many poems that you can. But reading should not be just passing your eyes from the first line to the last line. It's uh, an intellectual act. Uh, where you completely involve yourself, look at everything in the poem and let your mind work on it. Now, you might, you might ask me, isn't this very time-consuming process? Uh, could we always do it? No, it's like this. You know? It's like learning that skill and, uh, you know, preparing your mind and body to respond. And then it becomes easier. This is how we have to uh, look at a poem, uh, try ultimately to see how it is one, how it is a unity, how all these things in the poem come together and how through them we understand the meaning of the poem. Um, well, I'll uh, pause here for a while and then in the next part I'll uh, first talk to you about uh, how you would be writing um, after doing a practical criticism. Just a few hints. I'm not going to uh, go into any elaborate discussion and thereafter we shall uh, take two poems and uh, try how a close reading of those two poems can be done.